Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? It's a really cold winter's day here, so I figured nothing better than to go through and clean up some new acquisitions. I just picked up one of these for that much. Uh, I didn't actually pay that much though. I had a coupon, so it came down to like 35 bucks, something like that. This is one of the uh, kind of limited edition Pokemon Game Boy Color. This is the cool two-tone, yellow on front, blue on back. Um, it's in really good shape, but it's dirty. So I figured, you know what, let's get this thing cleaned up. One of the common questions that I get asked a lot is what kind of tools do I use? What kind of tools are necessary for getting into, you know, cleaning up, restoring, maintaining, modding game consoles? Uh, so I figured today would be a great opportunity to go over some of that. So I'm going to get this thing disassembled to get cleaned up. I'm going to use some of the tools that I normally would um, to take this thing apart and I'll show you what those are. And then we'll go through some of the other tools that you may not necessarily use on kind of a daily basis, but will make mods and repairs a heck of a lot easier. So the first thing that's probably the most important is going to be a decent set of screwdrivers. And this is kind of my little set that I keep at my desk here. This is from iFixit, it's the 26-bit driver kit. It includes a, a whole bunch of different styles of drivers. Not just regular Phillips and Flathead, but also some of the more rare stuff. Uh, Torx, security Torx with the hole in the middle, tri-wing, that sort of thing. It has this little driver end. Uh, it comes with a pair of tweezers, which is good for doing other kinds of work, but you also kind of need them to get the bits out because of how tightly they're packed in here. And they're kind of difficult to, you know, to, to pry out with your fingers, so I use the tweezers for that. You get a little extension with it. One thing that I like to tuck inside here, just because it's a decent place, is a guitar pick. This I'll talk about a little bit later along with another tool that's also used kind of in conjunction with it for if you're taking things apart. Some other things that are useful. This little driver kit is cool and it works on most screws, but sometimes you've got bigger screws that you need to get at or maybe they're recessed a little more deeply than what this kit could reach. So a lot of times I'll go down to the garage and get some of my normal kind of mechanics screwdrivers. Uh, these are just regular Craftsman ones. These you can get individually, you can get them as a set. You shouldn't have to spend more than 10 bucks on a decent set of just kind of regular screwdrivers like this. Very, very handy to have, not just for doing gaming stuff, but just work you know, around the house, working on other stuff that may be broken. So let's talk about some other tools that are useful for just kind of repairs. Uh, when you need to get into a console, especially kind of newer stuff or portable stuff, maybe stuff that's like really dirty, really grungy, that's been around the block a few times, the case halves can occasionally get stuck together. Like you may get all the screws out of something, but you just can't uh, pull it apart because there's just too much crap in there or the fit is too tight. A lot of people's first reaction is to just grab like a jeweler's flathead screwdriver. You know, stick the flathead bit in a screwdriver kit like this and just try to pry it open. More often than not though, if you do that, you will discover that it damages the plastic really, really easily. So the better way to do it is to use something called a spudger. You can get them in a kit with like a screwdriver set like this for my fix it. I just buy them individually because I go through them pretty quickly. They look like this. These have a bunch of different names. The proper name for them really is spudger. These are plastic, but they're a composite plastic, so they're really strong. They don't bend very easily. They are anti-static by nature, work, which works really, really nicely. It's got two ends on there, and each end is equally useful. It's got the pointy end, and I really like using that for if I need some help leveraging out a connector on a circuit board, something like that. You can kind of get in there and pry it up. The other end is the more useful end for taking things apart. It's this kind of wide, flat chisel, and all you do to use it is you just kind of stick it in the seam between the two, and you twist or you stick it in the seam and you pry up like that. It's really nice because it's plastic. It's generally gonna be as soft, if not softer, than the plastic you're trying to open. So it's really, really difficult to damage anything when you're trying to pry it open with the back end of a spudger. These generally cost about a dollar. I get mine from DigiKey, and I order them in packs of 10. 
Uh, of course, the more you order, the cheaper the price. I've always got six or seven floating around here just at my desk because I may break them. Sometimes you need more than one. Sometimes you just need to stick a spudger in there and leave it in there while you grab another one to pry the other side open. What can help you with that is the guitar pick. The guitar's pick, these are a lot cheaper and even more readily available than spudgers. These won't really help you initially get the unit open, but if you need to pry something open and keep it open for a while, the guitar pick comes in really handy for stuff like that. In terms of soldering iron, what I would recommend is going to be something like what I have. It's a Weller WLC 100. That's a little 40 watt iron. It's temperature controlled and temperature control is fairly important because you don't want to go into every soldering job guns blazing. You really kind of need to fine tune the amount of heat based on the component that you're working on and how much surface area is there you need to heat up. The one I have, that Weller, it only runs about 40 bucks on Amazon, so it's a great deal. The thing that it doesn't do so well is really, really fine soldering. What I found to work better is simply to get a different iron that's meant for kind of smaller jobs like that. For that, I've got actually a battery powered iron. That's my second one. It's a Hakko FX901. It is incredibly useful for an iron. It doesn't have a whole ton of thermal capacity. It only one does one temperature. It's not variable temperature. It takes a little while to heat up, probably three, four minutes. It lasts about an hour or so on a set of four AA batteries. But the thing was only like 20 to 25 bucks. It's pretty cheap. It's built really, really well. Hakko is a Japanese company. They make their products in Japan. It just does everything that I need it to do for really small repairs. It's got a super pointy, super sharp little pencil tip on the end that makes working on the surface mount stuff just so much easier. So that's actually the iron that I used when I did that DS light repair, um, just because it came in just so handy. So what other tools and supplies can come in really handy? Well, occasionally you've got some really proprietary screws, even more proprietary than like a tri-wing. Nintendo had a couple of these, and I know at least the N64 was put together with them. I think perhaps the GameCube and even the SNES had them as well. And they are called game bit screws. They're basically reverse Torx screws. Those are not in a kit like this, because they're really less frequently used even than tri-wing. Tri-wings are basically just Phillips, but instead of four lobes, it's only got three. I got a, a whole kit of security screwdriver bits, again, probably 10, 15 years ago. I got it off of eBay. I'd like to say it was 10 bucks with shipping. They're all over the place, just look. Uh, but it came with all sorts of security bits plus a couple of different sizes of game bit sockets. And they've come in very handy. So if you're going to start working on some specific consoles, that bit is going to come really useful as well. In terms of other kind of hand tools, really something like a pair of diagonal cutters could be really useful if you're dealing with wiring, if you're running new wiring, replacing some stuff, or needing to maybe cut out a little section of casing or something if you're doing a mod. Uh, these are really useful for a lot of different things. I use them oftentimes around the house just for cutting zip ties. The kind that I have here is by Hakko uh, as well. They're the CHP 170s. They're just a couple of bucks. They're pretty cheap, but they're really nicely made. You can find diagonal cutters at all the big box hardware stores, but they're usually really cheaply made and the spring mechanism on them falls apart after about a year's worth of use. So I like these because they have a really sturdy spring on them. In terms of other just general supplies that can come handy, um, one thing that I've got mixed feelings about is electrical tape. Sometimes electrical tape is really, really useful and works really, really well for certain tasks. The problem that I have with that is it's really not meant to be permanent because if you've ever come across or dealt with like old electrical tape, it turns to goo after not too long. Like you try to take it off and the tape comes off, but all the adhesive gets left behind and it's that real black gooey adhesive and it gets all over everything. 
That drives me nuts. So I try not to use electrical tape actually too often, but it's useful to have around, especially if you need to temporarily insulate something while you're working on it. For permanent insulation, say around a solder joint between two wires, that's where I'll use heat shrink tubing. We've talked about heat shrink tubing before. If you want a little bit more of a tutorial on how to use it, go check out my video about repairing cable damage on an SNES controller. Um, I'll include a link to that video down below. It's really nice stuff to have because it's a much more permanent solution. It doesn't leave residue. You can take it off. You can reapply a new section in its place without having to clean off any adhesive or, or crap left behind uh, when you use it. And it, it just gives you a much more professional looking repair, much more reliable repair especially if it's you know around cables and, and splice joints between wires, that sort of thing. So you wanna keep several different sizes of heat shrink tubing around based on the size of the wire joint that you're trying to, to insulate. Uh, that stuff thankfully is also very cheap. I get mine from DigiKey, you can get it in spools, you can get it in cut lengths. It doesn't cost a whole ton of money. And again, it's something that you're usually only using a little bit at a time. It lasts forever. I haven't had to buy heat shrink in years. A couple other things that are useful to have that gets you into some of the more kind of advanced repair and troubleshooting. Some spools of various colors and gauges of hookup wire. I ended up using some of the hookup wire when I was working on that Game Boy Advance backlight mod. I needed a length of jumper wire to go between that power point on the logic board and the little solder pad on that flex cable that goes between the motherboard and the replacement screen. So having various colors and sizes of that can come in handy for kind of those jumper links, that sort of thing. So the last tool that can come in really handy to have in your arsenal and is generally going to be used for more advanced troubleshooting and repair or mods is going to be a multimeter. This could be the single most expensive tool in your kit, depending on what features you want, how good a quality you want out of the tool. My multimeter is more expensive than any of the other tools that we've talked about here so far. I bought a Hyoki DT4252. You've seen me use it on camera a couple of times. That meter cost me 140 bucks. However, that meter is probably going to last me the rest of my life because I decided I wanted to buy a decent meter once instead of buying a cheap meter multiple times. I did a review on that meter a long time ago. I'll include a link to that one down in the description if you want to watch it. It's a little painful to watch, at least for me, because it's when I was first starting out with YouTube. It's one of the first beginning videos that I did. So I was still trying to kind of get the feel for how I wanted to do videos and getting used to talking on camera and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but of course, there's tons of other great brands for meters out there. Hioki's main competition, at least here in the US, really is going to be Fluke and Keysight. Keysight used to be known as Agilent, and Agilent used to be known as Hewlett Packard. Generally, with those meters, you're going to be dropping anywhere between 100 and 150 bucks for a good meter. But again, it's something that's going to last you forever and ever and ever. If you really only need to use a meter once or twice, not very often, you don't have high demands of it. You're only gonna be using it on like low voltage DC, like basically anything that runs off of batteries. And you only need just basic DC voltage measurement and continuity. And you don't care how accurate it is. And you don't care if the thing falls apart in a year or two. You don't care if it really drifts out of spec. Yeah, go ahead, you can buy cheap multimeters. They even sell them at the big box hardware stores. I've seen them for anywhere between 20 and 50 bucks. You'll probably want to upgrade from one of those if you really get into the modding and repair, console repair scene. As you start using it more, you'll bump up against its limitations or realize, wow, this thing really is kind of a piece of junk. I should have bought something better. If you do buy a multimeter, just be careful of its safety ratings. Try and look up reviews on the meter that you're interested in because some of them have some very egregious safety flaws to them. And even though they're rated for something, they're really not safe to be used at that kind of voltage or current level. So just remember you're sticking your hands into live electricity when you're using a meter. And yeah, if it's something that runs off of AA batteries, it's not gonna kill you. But if you then start using that on other things, like trying to repair an AC power supply where you've got mains voltage, 
you need to know what you're doing and you need to have a product that's going to keep you safe while you're doing it. I'm just not convinced that a cheap $10 meter is capable of doing that. So hopefully this video proved educational and useful to you. you got some good ideas to the kind of tools that you'll need for when you're working on your game consoles, doing mods and repairs. Remember that you may not always need all of these tools. Sometimes you'll buy a tool and you'll never use it, but you thought you would have needed it. I still don't see that as wasted money because you don't know what the future is going to hold. You may need that tri-wing screwdriver or that game bit screwdriver at some point in the future. What I would like is down in the comments, if there's any tools that I missed or any specific tool recommendations that you may have, go ahead and leave them down there. I wanna kinda of keep this conversation going. I'm sure that there are repairs and mods that you all have done that have involved tools that I haven't listed here. Tell us about them. Did you buy a multimeter and find it to be crap? Tell us about that one. Uh, do you have a particular favorite soldering iron or brand of solder or place to buy these tools? Go ahead and leave that down in the comments as well. So if you liked the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. They help out quite a bit. If you want to see more, I come up with new videos every week. The subscribe button is right down there. And as always, thank you all so much for watching.